Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis. Before we begin, I have a very special announcement. The arrival of Pop Culture Graveyard, the shirt. Make your friends envious. Make your enemies more envious. This logo was created by the brilliant artist Jeff Braun. Why yes, those are vinyl record UFOs. You can get this logo two ways, with the clean design or with this white outline that really helps the design pop against darker colors. You just go to the PCG Swag Store, click on which design you would like, pick what kind of merchandise you would like it on, and get it sent to you. It's just that simple. Please visit the link to our Redbubble store, PCG Swag, represented here. You can get shirts, stickers, notebooks, shower curtains, stockings, it's ridiculous the amount of places you could put my face. So if you enjoy the show and you like the content I'm bringing you, please think about supporting the show by picking up some merch. I'm so excited. I hope you find this news as titillating as I do. That might be a reach. So without further ado, on with the Magnificent Seven of underrated horror flicks. Before we get started, I just want to thank my latest patron. Thank you, Jared. You are the man, and I really appreciate the support. If you would like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash popculturegraveyard. And thanks. Now, happy Halloween. This is my favorite time of the year. Well, except for Christmas. That's up here. Actually, lately, New Year's Eve has been pretty nice. Dude, your birthday. Halloween is one of my favorite times of the year. I am a scary movie junkie. And that's why I wanted to bring you a magnificent seven of underrated fright flicks. These are in no particular order, so I'm just going to do them chronologically. Up first, the 1974 cult classic Death Dream. Death Dream was also released under the names Dead of Night, The Night Walk, and The Night Andy Came Home. But no matter what you call it, this is one underrated flick. Bob Clark has directed everything from Black Christmas to A Christmas Story. That is some serious range, my friends and he does a great job here. The film opens on a typical Middle America family receiving a telegram that tells them their son and brother, Andy, died in the Vietnam War. So imagine everyone's surprised when a little while later, Andy walks through the door. This just happens to coincide with a bunch of people dying. Andy's father is played by John Marley. First the guy gets a severed horse's head in his bed in The Godfather, and now his son comes back from Vietnam a zombie. The guy just can't catch a break. John's zombified son, Andy, is played by Richard Backus, who is the one actor you get when you absolutely, positively cannot get pure delay. The main thing that raises this film above its material is the acting. There are points where it seems as if John Marley thinks he's in a John Cassavetes film. Lucky for us. And it works. One of the first horror films to deal with the fallout of the Vietnam War on our boys in uniform, both emotionally and physically, Death Dream has a realism to it that makes most machete-wielding slasher fare seem quaint. That said, there is some gore. Thanks to makeup maestro Tom Savini, who is making his film debut as a makeup artist. If you're in the mood for a creepy flick that walks the line between independent film and lo-fi schlockfest, Death Dream is right up your alley. Up next, Dead and Buried, 1981. What makes this movie special is that the screenplay was written by Ronald Shusett and Dan O'Bannon. Ronald created the story for the sci-fi classic Alien, while Dan wrote the screenplay to that film. Dan also wrote and directed Return of the Living Dead, so he knows his way around a scare. That much will be clear within the opening 10 minutes. Jack Albertson, who played lousy layabout Grandpa Joe in Willy Wonka, and was the man in Chico and the Man, plays the mortician of a town called Potter's Bluff, where people keep getting murdered in the most gruesome ways. The entire town seems to be in on it, except for Sheriff John Farentino, who is the chief Brody character trying to get to the bottom of the mysterious murders. This movie's crew was like an all-star team, with the legendary Stan Winston doing the makeup effects, and Joe Renzetti doing the haunting piano score. And I really wish they had made a soundtrack for this film. The film even features Robert Englund a few years before he started starring as Freddy in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Creepy, endearing, and ultimately watchable the whole way through. This movie has an ending so positively bonkers, it somehow seems inevitable and still has maximum impact. As the tagline to the movie says, it will take your breath away. All of it. Also from 1981, Bloody Birthday. 
This is so high concept, and by that I mean a simple premise, and everyone plays it so straight. This is the tale of three children who were all born on the same day when there is a total eclipse of Saturn, which makes those kids just a little bit different. You know, they talk about the terrible twos, but once these scamps turn 10, people start dying. One of those incorrigible imps is played by Billy Jacoby, who would go on to star in several fright flicks, including Hospital Massacre, Cujo, and Nightmares, before becoming best known as Mikey Randall in Parker Lewis Can't Lose. One of the staples of horror films is nudity, and this film features, for my money, one of the greatest nude scenes ever filmed. It features one of the hottest women on the planet, Julie Brown. Yes, the homecoming queen's got a gun, Julie Brown. And she is beyond gorgeous here. But what's very cool about this nude scene is rather than being gratuitous nudity for no reason, the nude scene happens naturally in the plot of the movie and even advances the plot along. Julie's character is getting dressed and undressed while she dances to music, while her little sister charges boys a quarter a peek through the little peephole in her room. One crazy thing that jumped out at me while I was watching it this time, there's one scene where the killer kids are trying to get in and kill the girl and her young brother. And one of them is firing a gun through the door. And they're ducking from the gun as bullets come through. And big as life, there's a poster of Ted Nugent. The Motor City Madman is shirtless as these bullets are flying through. Crazy. I don't even know what to say about that. It's ironic, it's stupid, and it's perfect. That moment has aged like fine wine. Mwah. The pacing of the movie is beautiful. The child actors are great. It is a clever, tight script. And this flick punches way above its weight class. Our third and last entry for 1981, Student Bodies. I'm holding up the VHS copy because I want you to know how long I have loved this movie. Where's the attention to detail these days? Love it. Anyway, Student Bodies was a spoof of the slasher genre. The writer and director of Student Bodies, Mickey Rose, had been in comedy a long time before this film, most famously as the collaborator with Woody Allen on the comedies Take the Money and Run and Bananas. As you can guess from the title, a killer is stalking the local high school and students are turning up dead. Kristen Ryder heads up a cast of no-named actors as a mysterious killer known as The Breather. Kills them with a variety of strange weapons, including a paperclip and a horsehead bookend. A killer who does not like when kids have sex. Does any horror movie killer like that? As the character Malvert the janitor says in the movie, sex kills. The janitor, by the way, is played by The Stick. The Stick was the stage name of a guy named Patrick Boone Varnell. Only listed at six foot three, but looking about seven foot eight. The stick is textbook gangly, and he steals every scene he's in, including a ridiculous one where he shows just how double jointed he really is. Sadly, the stick died at the age of 48, so apparently there is such a thing as too gangly to live. This film has a lot of laughs and it has a high body count, but you don't even have to keep track of the body count because they do it for you on the screen. I obviously have a soft spot in my heart for this movie. It is not for everyone. Think of this movie as the horror equivalent of Airplane. If that's your type of comedy, run, don't walk. Up next, Slumber Party Massacre, 1982. The film's so nice, I bought it twice. I cherished this grainy, grainy print for years until they came out with an upgrade on Blu-ray, and I'm very happy they did. Not unlike Student Bodies the previous year, Slumber Party Massacre was supposed to be a spoof of slasher films. This film originated with a script by Rita Mae Brown. Yes, that Rita Mae Brown, the author of Ruby Fruit Jungle, originally titled Don't Open the Door, and later titled Sleepless Nights. By the time Rita's spoof reached the screen, it was titled Slumber Party Massacre, and the producers made it more of a straight-up slasher film in the mold of Halloween. As you can see on the cover, the killer uses an electric drill, which he holds down at waist length, pushing the phallic symbolism to the limit. One of the few films at the time produced and directed by a woman, Amy Holden Jones. The only false moments in the movie were insisted upon by the studio. I'm specifically talking about the nude shower scene, which unlike in Bloody Birthday, serves no purpose in the script. 
other than to titillate and appease Roger Corman's company and all the young boys that went to see the film. One really cool thing is the killer in this film is just an escaped mental patient. They're not trying to be cute with somebody wearing a mask, and I may be reading too much into this given that it's a female writer and female director, but what I gather from this is that men are scary enough. You don't need to invent some supernatural character to amp up the fright. Just a regular creepy guy with a power drill will suffice. This features gorgeous women, over-the-top special effects, and the wonderfully cheesy trappings of 1981. Little something people don't tell you about the 1970s. They ran right up through 1981. The movie asks several questions. How many dead bodies can you fit in the trunk of a car? Why is the killer totally dry after he gets out of a pool? And why does the killer's wireless electric drill never need its battery changed? By the way, this is the first film of Scream Queen Brinky Stevens. She was an extra in other films, but this was her first speaking role, and she has a small but memorable role. Another really cool thing about this movie, the women save themselves. The men in this film are treated almost like women are treated in every other horror film. They require saving, and I don't think they're going to make it. The true horror connected with this film is that the girl who played Valerie, the beautiful Robin Rochelle Still, committed suicide in 1996 at the age of 34. One of the fascinating things about this flick is that it comes across sometimes as two films jammed together. There are still some really cool laughs in the film. So some of Rita Mae Brown's funny, insightful satire bleeds through at the same time that this schlocky, by-the-numbers horror flick is playing out. And both films are fun to watch. Up next, The Stuff, 1985. This was written and directed by Larry Cohen, Orson Welles, Ed Wood, Russ Meyer, and Larry Cohen. These are the only auteurs this country has produced. I'm obviously a big fan of Larry Cohen. His brilliant work includes Bone, Cue the Winged Serpent, God Told Me To, Perfect Strangers, and the It's Alive franchise. And they're all entertaining, but The Stuff is my favorite Larry Cohen film. This is a really fun flick with equal amounts of laughs and scares. It's The Blob meets Invasion of the Body Snatchers. America's going crazy for The Stuff. It's an ice cream-like dessert that everyone becomes addicted to. It's smooth and creamy, it's low calorie and delicious, and it kills. The tagline to the film is, are you eating it or is it eating you? Michael Moriarty, who is the Robert De Niro to Larry Cohen's Martin Scorsese, is fantastic here as an industrial spy who's trying to discern exactly what the stuff is made of. He's aided by the beautiful Andrea Marcovici, the Madison Avenue whiz who marketed the stuff to the American public. The film also features SNL alumnus Garrett Morris as Chocolate Chip Charlie, a character based on self-made cookie magnate Famous Amos. Paul Servino plays an army colonel who bleeds red, white, and blue and declares war on the white scare known as the stuff. One very cool moment in the film, there is a supermarket scene in which a store clerk is played by a very young Eric Bogosian. Just a little subtle reminder that everybody has to start somewhere. One of the best parts about the movie is how brilliantly Larry Cohen pulls off the advertising campaign for this stuff. There are several commercials and billboards and ads that seem completely real, especially for the time. One of those commercials actually stars Barney Miller's Abe Vigoda and Clara Peller, a woman who rose to fame by screaming, where's the beef, in 1980s Wendy's commercials. Here she of course screams, where's the stuff? Cohen's horror satire skewers not only America's junk food obsession, but the corporate greed that fuels it. It's valid today as it was when it was released. The stuff's social commentary and satirical vision make for a very brainy horror movie. Last, but certainly not least, Wolf. 1994. If you have never seen Wolf, you're in for a treat. As far as I'm concerned, this film is a classic and deserves to be spoken of in the same breath as the werewolf classics Wolfen, The Howling, and An American Werewolf in London. It may seem odd to some of you that I'm picking a film directed by legend Mike Nichols, yes, the graduate Mike Nichols, and starring two of the biggest stars on the planet, Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer, and calling it underrated. But that's just what this baby is. 
When was the last time somebody talked to you about Wolf? Mike Nichols' pacing of this film is taut and energetic, and the plot unfolds effortlessly from the first frame. Jack Nicholson plays an editor-in-chief at a publishing house. One night he gets bit by a wolf, yada yada yada. People start showing up dead. I'm not given to hyperbole. But this might be Jack Nicholson's best performance ever. Oh sure, Five Easy Pieces. That's a great film. Yeah, a lot of good emotional growth. He's a frigging werewolf. It is difficult enough to play a werewolf, but the true magic happens during the scenes when he's not a werewolf. There are acting landmines throughout this film, and Jack just walks through the raindrops. Am I mixing metaphors? Yeah, but I don't care. It's that good. Humanistic in a way others' portrayals of the wolf man never are. Jack's performance, and everyone's performance for that matter, is top-notch and there is great humor in this film. Speaking of which, the deliciously smarmy James Spader, who made a career out of being deliciously smarmy, basically brings back Steph from Pretty in Pink and lets you know what he's up to now. The whole cast is great. Kate Nelligan is fantastic as Jack's wife. Christopher Plummer is on board. Yes, from The Sound of Music. He was dodging Nazis, now he's gotta contend with werewolves. The special makeup effects were done by Rick Baker, and he does an excellent job. This flick delivers on so many levels. It's a horror movie. It's a love story. It's a spoof of other werewolf movies. If you only check out one movie out of these seven, make it Wolf. I hope you enjoyed this magnificent seven of underrated horror movies. If you did, please do me a favor and click the like button. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.